Good evening, everybody. Good evening, good evening. Welcome to Books and Books here in Coral Gables, Florida. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, while you were silencing your cell phones, if you could please take a look at our Books and Books newsletter. This will give you a rundown of all the great events we have at Books and Books every night of the week. You can also go to our website, give us your email address. That way we can address you with all of the uh, events that come up without having to take this with you. And as you can see by all the lights and cameras, we are live streaming as we do many of our events here at Books and Books. So you don't even have to be here, although we do prefer you to be here. You don't have to be. You can always call the store during the event. You can ask a question of the author, which we will relay to them, or request a signed book, which we will ship anywhere to you in the United States free of charge. And again, as I say, you'll see some cameras pointing at the audience. So for the benefit of uh, people watching, please make sure you are sitting next to who you're supposed to be sitting next to. <laughs> Uh, but tonight, uh, we are very happy to have with us uh, Kai Bird and The Good Spy, The Life and Death of Robert Ames. Now, generally, when I do one of these uh, introductions, I like to um, research my subject matter and my, uh, my authors. I went to go to a site to look at uh, CIA operative Robert Ames. Unfortunately, this was all I could come up with. Um, <laughs> but I will say... On April 18th, 1983, a bomb exploded outside the American embassy in Beirut, killing 63 people. The attack was a geopolitical turning point. It marked the be beginning of Hezbollah as a political force, but even more important, it eliminated America's most influential and effective intelligence officer in the Middle East, CIA operative Robert Ames. What set Ames apart from his peers was his extraordinary ability to form deep, meaningful connections with key Arab intelligence figures. Some operatives relied on threats and subterfuge, but Ames worked by building friendships and emphasizing shared values, never more notably than when the Yasser Arafat's charismatic intelligence chief and heir apparent, Ali Hassan Salame, also known as the Red Prince. Ames' deepening relationship with Salame held the potential for a lasting peace. Within a few years, however, both men were killed by assassins and America's relations with the Arab world began heading down a path that culminated in September 11th, the war on terror and the current fog of mistrust. Kai Bird is the author of Martin, With Martin J. Sherwin of the Pulitzer Prize winning biography, American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer, which also won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Biography. He wrote The Chairman, John J. McCloy, The Making of the American Establishment and the Color of Truth, George McBundy and William Bundy, Brothers in Arms. He's the recipient of fellowships from the John Seaman Guggenhall, Guggenheim Foundation, the Alicia Patterson Foundation, the John T. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, Thomas J. Watson Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation Study Center, and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. He's an elected member of the American Society of Historians and a contributing editor of The Nation. He's a recent transplant to Miami. We welcome you. Please welcome Kai Bird. Thank you, Steve. Uh, that introduction reminds me uh, that my wife always reminds me I haven't had a job in 30 years. <laughs> I had lots of foundation uh, grants but, um, and book contracts, but not a real job. Anyway, I'm, I'm very glad to be here in, in Books and Books. I am, as of four months ago, uh, now a, a, a Miami native, and uh, it's it's fabulous so far. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> I'm going to begin actually 10 years after Ames was killed in the truck bomb attack that Steve was referring to in Beirut in 1983. 10 years later, on a very beautiful September day in 1993, uh, a man who was a CIA officer who was in charge of all covert operations for the Middle East named Frank Anderson was driving to work that day. And it should have been a very good day for him because he knew that Yasser Arafat was about to shake hands with Israel's Yitzhak Rabin on the White House lawn. And Frank had spent his whole career in the Middle East, this very troubled neighborhood, and uh, it should have been uh, a celebration for him that day, but he was, he was somehow uneasy. And when he got to his office that morning, he convened his regular 9 o'clock staff meeting and asked, who is going to represent the CIA on the White House lawn? 3,000 people have been invited. Surely someone from the agency is going to be there. 
and uh, a phone call was made and the answer came back, well, no one's going, not even the CIA director has been invited. So Frank Anderson turned to his aide and said, okay, let's get a couple of buses and round up 30 or 40 young newly minted uh, clandestine officers and some analysts and let's go visit our dead. And they drove out to Arlington National Cemetery and at the moment that Arafat and Rabin are shaking hands, they were standing at the gravesite of Robert Ames um, and Frank explained to the young officers who this man was uh, and how what was happening on the White House lawn really started back in 1969 when Ames managed to sort of plant the seeds of what we call now the Oslo peace process. <coughs> That's how I begin the book. Um, and it's, it's a full-blown biography of a CIA officer, which is most unusual. Um, but Ames was completely, is, I think, even to this day, completely unknown to most Americans. He's not the Aldridge Ames, who's now uh, a CIA officer who's living in prison. Uh, Aldridge Ames is the bad spy. Um, Bob Ames is a, was a very good spy. Uh, <clears throat> Ames, uh, unlike most sort of the, the stereotype of a CIA officer, particularly those who joined the agency in its formation in 1948 and throughout the uh, 50s and 60s, the stereotype of a CIA officer is someone who went to Yale or Harvard and was part of Skull and Bones at Yale and uh, is very blue, broad, blue blood and Boston Brahmin. But uh, Bob Ames grew up as the son of a steel worker in Philadelphia uh, he had no privileges. He went to college at La Salle in Philadelphia on a basketball scholarship. And uh, then was four years later was drafted into the U.S. Army and happened to be stationed abroad in Cagnew Station, a uh, listening post run by the U.S. Army uh, in Ethiopia up in the mountains. And there he learned for the, heard for the first time the Arabic being spoken in the streets. And it, it, for some reason, I, it just clicked. He, he had a fascination for the language and its rhythm and cadence. And he started trying to teach it to himself. It's a very difficult language. Aside from Chinese, it's probably the hardest language in, in the world for an English speaker to learn. Um, Anyway, he came back from the Army and joined the CIA in 1960 and was sent to the farm, this legendary um, training facility in Virginia where he was taught all sorts of martial arts. And, and then his first posting was in Dahran, Saudi Arabia in 1962, where I met him. And this is sort of how I came to this book. Uh, he was my next door neighbor for when I was 11, 12, and 13 years old. My father was a foreign service officer and uh, in this tiny little consulate in Arabia, and uh, there were maybe 20 houses in the consulate compound, and Ames lived across the street uh, with his beautiful blonde, blue-eyed wife named Yvonne, who looked like Lee Volman. Um, so I, they were very memorable to me, and I have you know, vivid memories of, of this couple. Uh, Ames was himself a very tall, handsome young man in his late 20s then. He was six foot three, uh, blonde, blue eyes, looked, you know, all American. He still played basketball with the Marines as often as he could. And, and I didn't know he was a spy. Um, my father later told me, uh, several years later that indeed he was a, you know, remember that Bob Ames, he was a CIA officer, not a foreign service officer. Um, anyway, Ames went on to uh, several other postings. Top Dahran was his first, it was four years, then Beirut, then um, uh, he, he also went to Aden for a couple of years, a very dangerous spot. Uh, he spent time in Iran, in Kuwait, and also back in CIA headquarters um, in Langley, Virginia. 
Um, <clears throat> the heart of the AIM story, though, um, aside from the fact that I was able to do a biography of him, partly because I knew his wife, his widow, um, but the heart of his story, the reason to read this book is what he achieved as a covert operator in 1969. Uh, he was in Beirut, and uh, this was a chaotic period in uh, the Middle East at the time in the aftermath of the 1967 war uh, where Israel had defeated all these Arab armies and um, that had left a vacuum and it was being filled in part by Arab revolutionaries and specifically the Palestine Liberation Organization. Um, and Ames had a friend, a Lebanese businessman who he cultivated, and this friend, Mustafa, happened to know a man named Ali Hassan Salome, a 28-year-old, dashing, very handsome uh, Palestinian who happened to be sort of Arafat's chief bodyguard and his virtual intelligence chief. Uh, Ames initially thought this might be, Ali Hassan might be a target for recruitment, that's what his job was. He's a case officer. He's supposed to go out and recruit agents. Um, <clears throat> he had Mustafa set up a, a first meeting. It was a sort of classic uh, covert operation in which there was a, a scenario, a, a script that each party was supposed to follow for security reasons. Um, they were going to meet in the Strand Cafe on Rue Hamra in West Beirut. And uh, Ali Hassan was going to bring his bo armed bodyguards from what uh, called Force 17, the sort of elite body bodyguard unit around Arafat. And Ames is going to bring his own uh, hired, hired guns for security reasons. He knew he was meeting with a dangerous man, a young man who carried a pistol in his belt, uh, who was a professional revolutionary, terrorist, freedom fighter, however you want to label him. And uh, <coughs> the, the script was that uh, Mustafa and Ali Hassan were to be sitting at a cafe table and Ames would saunter by casually on the sidewalk. And as he walked by the table, Mustafa would put out his hand and uh, rest it on Ali Hassan's shoulder to indicate that this is the man that you're going to meet later. Well, Ali Hassan never followed a script, and he jumped up and <laughs> introduced himself and <laughs> shook hands with Ames and turned to Mustafa and said to Ames, this is my man. Um, and then a few days later, they met in a CIA safe house and uh, began to sort of have this covert dance relationship where each side was sort of feeling each other out. And, um, and Ali Hassan was, he, he had an agenda. He was trying to get this CIA officer to talk to him and thereby get the U.S. government to talk to the PLO and to sort of recognize the PLO as a political entity in the Middle East. And Ames was, you know, initially trying to recruit Ali Hassan and also influence him and get information from him. Ames decided very quickly that, that Ali Hassan was not recruitable. Uh, he would never accept money. He would never sign a contract um, in any formal sense. Um, but he could turn it into a friendship. And he, he did this. It took several years. There were some ups and downs. And, uh, but Ames was, was a very affable guy. He was not a James Bond. Uh, he was a good spy because he could make friends, not enemies. And uh, he gained Ali Hassan's trust. Now, these two men were complete opposites. I mean, Ames was uh, uh, married to Ivan, had eventually six children, was devoted to his family, uh, liked basketball and listening to he, his favorite music was the Beach Boys. And uh, <clears throat> he loved pretzels and root beer. He wasn't a drinker. He rarely took any alcohol. 
Ali Hassan liked to dress in all in black with a black leather jacket and a gold chain and, and uh, a pistol in his belt. And uh, he loved beautiful women and good French red wine and fast cars. And he spoke several languages. And he was, he was uh, uh, a playboy. The Israelis later on gave him the moniker the Red Prince. Um, sort of for obvious reasons. He was sort of Palestinian aristocracy, and he acted like a prince. Anyway, they were totally opposites, but somehow they clicked, and they, he, they formed a relationship. Um, this is at a, at a time in 69, for the next 10 years, this friendship survived. But in the midst of it, the Israelis as early as 1970 and then in 73, tried to assassinate Ali Hassan. Um, they knew who he was, and they believed that he was involved with the Black September terrorist wing of uh, Fatah, the, the main group in the PLO, and they believed that he was involved in Munich the terrible tragedy in the Munich Olympics where 11 Israeli athletes were killed. And uh, for, a, for a time after the Munich Olympics, Ames thought he couldn't pursue Ali Hassan anymore because of that. It was too horrible. It was, um, but there was, it emerged that there was contradictory evidence and uh, murky evidence about how um, closely involved Ali Hassan was. Um, and he, he convinced he, Mustafa, in fact, his sort of virtual access agent, uh, uh, his Lebanese businessman friend, who never took any money for being his his uh, intermediary. He was never an agent himself. Mustafa, nevertheless, convinced Ames that at the time that Munich had happened, Arafat had happened to put Ali Hassan on a disciplinary three-month uh, leave of absence, a suspension. And so Mustafa, Mustafa claims that Ali Hassan was traveling in Europe when M Munich happened. In any case, M Bob Ames did pursue the relationship. He, uh, it sort of became cemented in 1973, and thereafter they had regular meetings. Now, this was at a time when, you know, the U.S. government was not meeting with anyone from the PLO. Henry Kissinger and the Nixon administration and successive administrations had promised the Israelis that they would never have any meetings with representatives from the Palestinian Liberation Organization. And indeed, uh, in a few years later, uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, ambassador to the United Nations, Andrew Young, was fired because he had an inadvertent casual meeting in New York with a PLO <coughs> representative. Um, but this, is a, this kind of relationship with a, quote, bad guy in a dangerous neighborhood is precisely what a CIA officer is supposed to do. He's supposed to try to develop contacts and information from people that a regular American diplomat can't. Um, anyway, the, the, <clears throat> the Israelis knew about this relationship, and that was another reason, actually, why they wanted to assassinate Ali Hassan. So a, a key moment in the book comes when uh, a Mossad officer approaches one of Ames's bosses in London and asks the direct question, is Ali Hassan your man? Is he your agent? And uh, this question was asked to a man named Alan Wolf, who uh, <clears throat> turned around and walked away without giving an answer. But this precipitated a, a deep debate inside the agency. Well, what do we tell the Israelis? And indeed, uh, a few months later, David Kimchi, the Mossad officer in charge of all foreign um, liaison operations with other intelligence groups like the CIA, flew from Tel Aviv to meet with Ames and again asked the question. And it, it presented a, a severe dilemma for them because, of course, Ali Hassan was not an agent. And if they told the Israelis that he was, 
um, to pr try to protect him. Uh, they feared that the Israelis might turn around and leak this information in the streets of Beirut, making Ali Hassan a target from his own people for being a traitor, a spy, as such. Um, so in the end, they decided that the best answer was no answer. And uh, Ames warned Ali Hassan to beef up his security. Uh, he actually sent encrypted communications equipment to Beirut to try to help him with his security. There was even discussion of, well, maybe we can send an armored car. That never happened. It never made it there. Um, but in the late autumn of 1978, Mossad infiltrated 15 uh, officers into Beirut and uh, on January 22nd, 1979, uh, Ali Hassan was driving in his convoy, three cars, armed guards everywhere, and he drove by a VW bug that was parked on the street and, and as he drove by it exploded and he was he was killed along with eight other um, civilians in the street uh, <clears throat> this ended the Ames Ali Hassan relationship but actually it continued in that uh, the Americans didn't stop with uh, talking to the PLO it was necessary to do so. By 1979, uh, you know, the PLO was a major player inside Lebanon, which was rendered um, by this terrible civil war in which tens of thousands of people were being killed. And uh, <clears throat> the, Ali Hassan was, among other things, providing security for the American embassy, which was located in Fatah territory in West Beirut. Um, so in, even after his death, the relationship continued. And one of the reasons that the CIA argues even today inside the agency, they regard Ames as being sort of having planted the seeds of the Oslo peace process. He had, over the 70s, the argument is, he had, uh, while Ali Hassan was trying to persuade uh, the Americans to recognize the PLO, Ames was trying in a very blunt fashion over dinner at Ali Hassan's apartment in West Beirut, um, trying to persuade him and Arafat to put down the guns and talk about a political solution, to think about uh, achieving Palestinian aspirations over a part of Palestine, uh, to think about a two-state solution. And indeed, if you look at the evolution of the PLO over that decade of the 70s, from 69 to 79, that's the direction the, the PLO is headed. And that is the, that's the origins of, of Oslo. Um, I want to leave lots of time for questions, but um, to give a, give a little s more sense of, of uh, both Bob Ames as a person and the sort of sources of the book. Uh, <clears throat> initially, I thought I could only tell the story of the, the Beirut embassy bombing itself, that I wouldn't be able to do a really in-depth biography of a CIA case officer, because who would talk to me? The CIA was not very unlikely to cooperate um, everything was classified, but the Beirut embassy bombing, which occurred on April 18th, 83, in which Ames died, uh, was a very public event, and 17 Americans died, including eight CIA officers and 47 Lebanese, and it's sort of the forgotten bombing. If Americans remember these events at all, they remember the terrible truck bomb attack that, against the Marine barracks that happened six months later, and in which 241 U.S. servicemen were killed. You know, many more casualties. But the embassy bombing is forgotten, even though it was the first attack, the first real sort of terrorist attack on a, a U.S. facility abroad. Um, Anyway, I thought I could just do the embassy bombing, but as I got into the book, I found the widow, Ivan, 
She uh, agreed to an interview. I spent a long weekend with her in North Carolina where she lives in very um, simple circumstances in a small farmhouse, cottage. Uh, but she had saved the family photo album and she said there were some letters somewhere, she thought. Um, maybe a suitcase up in an attic of her, her, one of her daughters. And uh, so it took six months, but I gently encouraged her to search for those letters, not knowing what would be in them. Um, but eventually she found them, and the letters turned out to be just a treasure trove. There were about 150 pages of handwritten letters from Bob Ames to her, um, and it describes his life as he's out on these short-term trips to places like Aden or Beirut or Tehran, um, and it describes his daily routine as a case officer. So for the first time, you sort of get a real sense of of, of what a spy does. And among other things, it's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of writing memos about who said what to whom. Um, and it's a lot of going out to meet people and cultivating new friends. Um, Ames had to indeed carry a pistol occasionally, but he hated guns. He thought they were useless. If he was going to be killed, it would probably be with a bullet to the back of his head and he'd never see it coming. So he thought carrying a pistol was, was pretty pointless. Um, anyway, the letters turned out to be just invaluable. They opened up the subject and allowed me to turn it into a real biography. And it turns out his letters also not only talked about his daily routine and his, uh, you know, how much he missed his six children and his wife and mundane things of daily life, but they also talked about his work and his relationship with Ali Hassan Salome because his wife knew about it. Now, oddly enough, when he died, he had six children. Only the eldest, who was 21 years old, knew that he was a CIA officer. The five other children thought he was a low-level State Department employee. And they only learned the truth on the day he died when a knock came at the door and two CIA officers came to tell them that their father had been killed. Um, anyway, I found many more sources including uh, this fellow Mustafa, who the Lebanese bus businessman, Mustafa Zain, who uh, who's saved his own letters that he had received from Ames, and photographs and uh, great stories. And I found more than 40 retired CIA officers who uh, had either known Ames and who had known Ames and uh, who wanted the story told. And they ended up telling me, you know, 30 and 40 year old secrets as such, but they didn't care. They, they were not really anything endangering national security, but they wanted the Bob Ames story told. And their stories are just uh, in incredible and detailed. And again, they allowed me to sort of turn it into a biography. Um, Finally, I'll just give you a sort of another sense of Ames by telling you a, another story from the book. In, in about in the spring of 1977, uh, Ames was sent to Beirut for a short-term three-month assignment to replace a station chief who was going on vacation. Uh, this was a very dangerous moment in Lebanon. The civil war was raging violently. Uh, the city was divided. Uh, there was a no man's land that ran right through the middle of the city, dividing sort of basically west and east Beirut from each other. Um, and Muslim versus Christian, but also many complicated alliances. And uh, Ames was one of only two officers in the embassy who were allowed to leave the premises without being accompanied by armed bodyguards and uh, armored car and the whole whole deal. And you know, of course he couldn't do his work as a clandestine officer if he was surrounded by by um, armed armed men. 
So he rented a um, beat up old Toyota from a local rental car agency and uh, drove around town meeting his contacts and often meeting with Ali Hassan every other night. And uh, one, <clears throat> one evening he had to take a trip across the no man's land to East Beirut, to the Christian sector. And uh, he knew that m meant crossing th these dangerous checkpoints. And indeed, he was stopped at a checkpoint manned, in this case, by a contingent of Yemeni tribesmen who were part of the Arab League's peacekeeping force trying to tap down the violence in this dangerous Lebanese civil war. And <clears throat> they forced him out of the car and began searching the car and they opened the trunk and s saw to their astonishment a metallic s cylinder object that looked to them like a bomb and jumped back fingering their submachine guns and uh, pointing them at Ames who quickly had to talk his way out of this dangerous moment with his Arabic which was pretty good and proved to be life-saving in this instance because he had to explain to these illiterate Yemeni tribesmen what a vacuum cleaner was. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, uh, the, the Yemenis had no concept of what a vacuum cleaner was or why anyone would need a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> uh, to them it looked like a bomb. But his Arabic was good enough to get him out of this tight situation. And uh, he later, the next day, wrote a, a letter to his wife, to Yvonne, uh, recounting this incident, which is why I know about it. And uh, he told her that what was going through his mind the whole time was Graham Greene's novel, Our Man in Havana. <laughs> Of course, you're all, you've, you've read there. It's all about a, a vacuum cleaner salesman who's mistaken for being a spy. Um, anyway, I love this, this anecdote because it sort of captures Ames' personality, his courage, his, uh, you know, his, uh, he was very well read. He was an intellectual, and he had a sense of humor, and uh, he's just a very cool character. Um, uh, I could go on. I can also talk a little bit about, at, uh, maybe in the question-answer period, we can talk a little bit about who killed Ames. This is the end story in the book, and it's very controversial and very current because uh, it was, I believe, uh, an operation, this truck bomb, carried out by the Islamic Republic of, of Iran. And this was actually proven to the satisfaction of a U.S. federal district court judge in 2003 when Yvonne Ames and other relatives and survivors of the embassy bombing sued Iran in a civil suit case. And there was a trial. The Iranians didn't contest it, but there was a trial, and Yvonne and other um, relatives testified. And there were expert witnesses um, from the government um, who testified that the plastic explosives used in the truck bomb attack, for instance, uh, were military grade, not available in Lebanon, and came from a military factory in Iran. But <clears throat> I actually name in the book a number of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard intelligence officers who were stationed in the Bekaa Valley in the summer of 1982, right after Israel invaded Lebanon. and. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the stunner is at the end of the story you will learn that one of these uh, Iranians is defected in 2007 and at some point was here in America and was debriefed by the intelligence community because he brought with him a laptop with information about Iran's nuclear program and information from his long years advising Hezbollah on their intelligence and military operations. So it's a classic sort of intelligence conundrum. Again, dealing with a bad guy, making a deal, a really hard deal. A man who, you know, 
was complicit in the in the deaths of eight CIA officers, their own men, and many other Americans. And yet, these kinds of deals apparently are done all the time. Uh, as one of my sources said, well, you know, quoting the old phrase, you you sometimes have to sup with the devil and use a very long spoon. Anyway, I will end on that, and I hope I've uh, talked enough to sort of stimulate some questions. Well, if you, they told the Israeli Mossad officers, oh, this guy is not our man, he's not an agent, that the implication clearly was that Mossad would consider this a green light. That means, okay, we can go after him and kill him if we want. Well, they did anyway. They did anyway. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, I talked to some officers who said that, you know, they, in their opinion, they think a mistake was made, that something should have been done to preserve Solomon, not only because he was a great source and he was protecting Americans by this time and he was no longer, quote, a ticking bomb, um, but that he was a smart, intelligent Palestinian who might help to persuade Arafat to go in the direction of what we call the Oslo peace process more quickly and so, uh, you know there were many reasons but so they thought something should have been done but it was a mistake I think yes uh, congratulations on your segment last night on BBC America oh. uh, I wish we were brought the clip tonight. it was really <laughs> superb it, it, it started out at the tombstone of Robert Eames with our author there in Arlington Cemetery explaining what was on the book, and uh, we were lucky enough just to bump into it. And uh, we lived in Beirut many of those years. I read the book, it is superb, and just want to know, when are we going to get to see the movie? <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife, who's sitting here in the audience, asked me this about every book. <laughs> this is my sixth book, and you know, it hasn't happened yet, but... <laughs> Uh, you don't make you don't make a lot of money off of books, but um, movies help to change that equation. I think it is a very cinematic. Um, you'll see the book has uh, 41 photographs in it, and they're very unusual. They're you know most of them are have never been published before. They're pictures of Ali Hassan Salama, pictures of Mossad officers who've never been printed in this country. There are um, pictures of the site where Ali Hassan, the, you can see the car in which he was killed on, on the, in the street in Rue Verdun in Beirut. Um, anyway, it, it is a very cinematic, but I, I have no news about a, a movie deal. <laughs> yes? I remember the big, you know, the bombing of the Beirut barracks. My question is. But you uh, forgot you. I did. I did. I forgot that. But I remember very the well the Marine barracks. Yeah. I really remember that. And I knew Israeli soldiers who were fighting in Lebanon at the time. But my my question is, um, in his letters, did he express any views about what was going on? I mean, at that time, the Israelis went all the way into Beirut. And, it was the Christian East and the Muslim West, and it was really a, a balagan, as they say. I'm just curious if it was just basically these communications or he actually expressed um, any views. Oh, yes. Certainly. And of course, I would, you know, I intend to buy the book, particularly for my father, that would find very interesting, but that's what I was asking. Yeah, no, actually, uh, Ames had an unusual career in another sense in that he started out on the covert side as a clandestine officer, but he, the higher he rose and the longer he was in the clandestine officer, the more frustrated he became with that part of the agency's business. And um, 18 years into his career, he switched to the analytical wing of the agency. And that meant he was no longer, he no longer had to be undercover. 
you know, he could become a, a, a public person as such. And he was then allowed to brief policymakers. In, and so he was, by 1981, he was the guy who was briefing Ronald Reagan on anything to do with the Middle East. And he persuaded, he became very influential, he was regarded as Mr. Middle East inside the Reagan administration. And when anything happened out there that Ronnie needed to know about, uh, Ames would be called into the Oval Office or to Camp David often. And uh, in the period that you're talking about, right after the Israeli invasion in, eight, in the summer of 82 of Lebanon, you know, which created a huge crisis, both in the White House, but also in Jerusalem, and of course in, in, in Lebanon. Um, Ames persuaded Secretary of State George Shultz um, to sign on to a something extraordinary for the first time, a, an American initiative to try to solve this mess, a comprehensive settlement. Um, previously, we'd always tried to play the role of arbitrator. You know, we'll bring the two parties together like at Camp David that Jimmy Carter did in 78, 79, and try to mediate. Um, but out of frustration that, you know, this was this festering problem just was going on and on, Ames persuaded Reagan to give a speech on September 1st, 1982 which is now called, which became known as the Reagan Peace Plan. And it, it, was, uh, it was essentially a, a proposal for a two-state solution with Israel withdrawing from the occupied territories in the West Bank and Gaza. They weren't actually talking about a Palestinian state, but returning those occupied territories to some form of Palestinian self-determination, probably under the Jordanian um, Hashemite monarchy's uh, umbrella. And so Ames was very upset by the Israeli invasion. He thought this, you know, was counterproductive and would, would be bad for the Israelis as bad and, and as well as for the Palestinians in the long run. Um, he was, you know, he was an Arabist and he was very pro-Palestinian. Um, uh, on the other hand, you can see from his letters he is very empathetic. I recount, rec I quote from one of the letters they wrote to Ivan from Jerusalem. He's visiting there and, and uh, he comes, he's going on a walk through the old city and he comes upon the Wailing Wall and uh, sees hundreds of Israelis praying, um, Orthodox Jews praying at the Wailing Wall. And, you know, he says, you know, this, seeing them there, reminded me that this city should never really be divided again. He writes to Yvonne, uh, you know, these people need to have access. They need to be able to get to this holy site. And, um, and he, as he switched to, when he switched to the analytical side and became head of the whole directorate of um, intelligence for the Middle East, that required him to go out to Tel Aviv uh, once or twice a year and meet with his Mossad counterparts. And they knew exactly who he was. They knew he was the guy who had opened up this back channel to the PLO and they were, you know, <laughs> curious and yet critical. And But they loved him because he was open and there was nothing, you know, he didn't hide his views. They got into great arguments. The Israelis love a good argument, <laughs> as you may recall. And... Um, so they respected him, yeah. and they saw that he could even have some empathy for their difficult quandaries in, in facing a, you know, a, a difficult, intractable, stubborn enemy. Yes, yes. Sir. In your work toward this book, did you ask for, did you receive any cooperation from the agency? Absolutely. Yeah. And no. <laughs> I asked, I got nothing. Um, I, I, in the very beginning, I went out and I had a meeting with George Little, who was at the time the head of public affairs for the agency. And uh, so I got into the beautiful headquarters there, and we had an hour-long meeting in his office, and I explained, you know, I'm writing a 
book that's going to be a biography about a CIA hero. Um, and all I really want, what I asked for was a chance to sit down with an in-house historian. Um, one, you know, an historian who works for the CIA. Um, and have a chance just to ask some simple questions and check basic facts like chronology, job titles. And if they, you know, found a way to declassify a few documents, that would be terrific. <laughs> um, and George said, well, yeah, it sounds like a good idea, and, you know, I'll see what I can do. And I think he tried and never got an answer, and I sent emails to General Petraeus, who was the director later on in the project, and uh, he was busy <laughs> with other emails. <laughs> Um, but I think, you know, it's really hard for a secret intelligence organization to say, oh, we should talk to this journalist, historian. Um, they, they, they just, you know, they don't want to do it. But my CIA retired officers virtually declassified things for me. <laughs> Knowing that the Iranians were always behind most of these uh, attacks and bombings throughout the years, but like you're saying, in '83, this sort of began a, uh, a number of, of, it, it, of it incidents. I mean, we have the the bombing at the embassy, of Beirut, uh, a year later, TWA 847, and all of these really were run by Hezbollah, and and the guy behind it, Imad Mughaniya, who was the chief of ops. He's the guy who, I mean, he went on later on to, uh, they had the kidnappings of all the, uh, the Westerners in Beirut, uh, Bill, was it Bill uh, Buckley, right. CIA station chief, and then even going into the 90s and 92, the bombing of the Israeli <coughs> embassy in Argentina and the cultural center. All of those, uh, you know, people give, put none that the blame or credit on Iran, but Hezbollah was a heck of a force to, to, uh, uh, to contend with, uh, and they, to some degree, they still are today. And I'm just wondering, um, is there any mention in, in your book or, or in your studies about... Oh, more than a mention. Okay. <laughs> just there's a lot that. about Imad Muznia in the book. Uh, there's a sort of mini biography of Muznia. Uh, he, you're right, he was later in the 80s, he was apparently on the TWA plane that was hijacked in which this Navy diver was shot and killed and his body dumped. And uh, he was involved in a long string of uh, kidnappings and other attacks. And then he, uh, he, he rose to become sort of the chief sort of intelligence officer and commander of Hezbollah forces during the 2006 Lebanon war with Israel. Um, but Imad Mugnia in 1983 was only 20 years old. And uh, so I think he was involved in some way, but he couldn't have carried out this truck bomb attack on his own. It was, it was a very complicated, expensive operation, and it had to have state sponsorship. There is a whole story in the book about Imad Mugnia because at the age of 16, uh, I recount, he was recruited by Ali Hassan Salame, ironically enough, into Force 17. <laughs> and he was trained as a bodyguard for Arafat. Um, and he, he apparently spent a little time at AUB, the American University of Beirut. Um, so, but in 1982, when he was 20 years old, he, he was a bodyguard for Arafat. He was seen in Arafat's bunker just before he left in August of 82 for Tunis when the PLO was expelled. And, um, but Mugnia was left behind. He wasn't Palestinian. He was uh, Shiite Lebanese who had grown up in Sabra and Shatila in part. And so that's why he was 
sympathetic to the Palestinian cause and was employed by Force 17. But having been left behind, and then soon thereafter, the Sabra and Shatila massacre takes place in which a 1,000, uh, maybe 2,000 people were killed by Maronite militias, just in a terrible massacre in his, Mugnia's neighborhood, Sabra and Shatila. This, I think, you know, provided his motivation um, for going to work for what was early Hezbollah. Hezbollah didn't exist until re formally until 1985, but early formations of it emerged um, after the Israeli invasion when a break-off group from the Amal party, representing the Shiites of Lebanon, um, began getting assistance from Iran, who had sent a force of 1,500 Revolutionary Guards to the Bekaa Valley. And uh, I have sources saying that this is when Imad Mugnia was recruited by the Iranians, and Hezbollah was a fully, you know, it was a creation of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. So it, it comes sort of full circle. And there were two famous spies that were caught and assassinated, one in Egypt and one in Iran. Uh, public executions. Were they assets of Ames? Um, public, publicly executed in Egypt in what? What what years or in the fifties? Yeah, no. This they <clears throat> no is the answer. <laughs> Ames, they were not Ames's agents. In fact, Ames was criticized inside. He he had lots of friends, very few enemies. His only enemies were inside the agency, <laughs> and it was because some of his fellow officers in the clandestine services thought he was too much of an intellectual. He spent too much time learning Arabic, and he didn't recruit enough agents. <laughs> and it's true, he didn't really recruit a lot of people. He, he's best known for creating this friendship with Ali Hassan Salama and, and other sources in this very dangerous neighborhood, but sources that U.S. diplomats normally couldn't talk to. Yes? Okay, to uh, Miami. Are you writing something about us? <laughs> I'm convinced there are many retired spies down here, right? <laughs> no, uh, I just go where where Susan wants to go. <laughs> and uh, Susan had a long career in the World Bank, and she just retired after 25 years. And she had, li we were living in Lima and coming up off and on, and she. she Visited Miami and thought it was uh, a nice place. Um, as far as the bombing, what was the aim of that? Were they going after the embassy in general, CIA offices, or him in particular? And uh, as far as the bombing also, was the uh, embassy at all a hardened building? And with the big losses they took, did they do anything afterwards to start changing policies to protect our embassies? Right. Oh, great question. Uh, briefly, no, they did not go after the CIA station in particular, although they got lucky and they killed, they wiped it out. They killed eight CIA officers. One, one CIA officer was out, out of the building at, just by chance bargaining to buy a Persian rug. <laughs> in a local shop. Um, no, they, they got lucky. They were targeting the embassy, and it was clear the Iranians and this early Hezbollah group were angry at the Americans, um, partly because of the Sabra and Shatila massacre, but they believed that the Americans had stopped being a neutral um, peacekeeper in the Lebanese Civil War and that they had tilted to the Christian Maronite um, factions and to Israel. And so they believed that, you know, so they, they, they targeted the embassy as a, in their minds, as a military target. Um, the embassy was built, it was an old apartment building, um, which I actually lived in when I was 10 years old on the third floor. 
for a year because my father was stationed there learning Arabic in 1961. Um, and it was a lovely building, but right on the Corniche, right on the sea, um, just across the street was this lovely Corniche sidewalk where you could stroll on along the seaside. And um, there was no security. I did learn that uh, a security officer I interviewed later told me that they had decided to bring in one of these steel barriers that would at least block the the uh, the lane into the driveway into the front of the building where the suicide bomber just drove straight through and crashed into the main main door um, but it was scheduled to be installed two weeks later the you know it was a tragedy all around and if you know you, you've been reading about the current congressional investigations of the Benghazi incident well there was no investigation of the embassy bombing or the marine barracks there was some army investigations and eventually that report was declassified years later but there were no congressional hearings on this but it, it is true that starting with the embassy bombing and then particularly after the embassy attacks in Kenya um, many years later, you know, you go to any embassy, in, any American embassy anywhere in the world today, and it is a fortress. It, they often have moats around them. I mean, they're hard to get into. It's even for Americans to visit, to, you know, do consular stuff. It's just horrible and the Americans trapped inside these embassies these officers who are supposed to be our diplomats mingling with the foreigners you know find it very difficult to get out and mingle it's you know the security is so tight because of all these this this history so in this sense the again the the terrorist tactic has worked it's uh, forced us into a, you know, a siege mentality that I think is very counterproductive, my opinion. <laughs> um, Uh-oh. Tell the story of the second wife while she's still his girlfriend. Oh. <laughs> well, Ali Hassan um, Salome, as I said, was a... a exuberant, very charismatic young man who loved life and loved beautiful women. And he was married to a beautiful Palestinian woman. He had two young boys with her. And uh, in 1976, Ames learned to his horror that uh, Ali Hassan had met a young woman named Georgina Rizik who in 1971 had been crowned Miss Universe by Bob Barker here in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> and Ali Hassan was squiring Georgina around the nightclubs of Beirut openly. And it was, you know, the, 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 the fact of this was being written about in the gossip pages of the Lebanese press, and his picture was, and Ames thought this was, you know, very bad spycraft. <laughs> <laughs> but it also offended his, his own decorum. He was, you know, a family man and devoted to his wife, and he knew Ali Hassan's wife, and he wrote actually to Ivan, complaining about Ali Hassan's behavior and saying I'm trying to to I'm I'm trying to persuade him to um, to stop this relationship it's a real embarrassment I don't see what he sees in this other woman who was Miss Universe <laughs> uh, but he was unsuccessful and and in 1977 um, in the spring of 70, no, winter of 77, uh, Ali Hassan tells Bob he, uh, well, Bob had invited him to come to the United States on a highly secret visit. They had to arrange, you know, passport, false passports, the whole deal, and uh, they wanted to have a debriefing with him on U.S. soil. And Ali Hassan said, yes, I'll come, but I want to bring Georgina. 
And Georgina really wants to visit Disneyland <laughs> in California, I think, the California one. And, I'm, and then Ali Hassan says, I'm really in need of a vacation, too. So I'd like to visit Hawaii as well. So they came, Georgina and Ali Hassan, and Ames arranged the visit to Disneyland, to New Orleans, to uh, Hawaii, and assigned a CIA officer to, as their guide around all these locations. Um, it's an extraordinary sort of episode. <laughs> but we have time for one more question. What took him back to the embassy to be there at that particular time if he had already? Right. Well, he, uh, he had become <coughs> chief of the analytical division for the Middle East. Um, it, it was a desk job as such in Washington where he's briefing Reagan off and on. But he, hadn't been, he felt he hadn't been back to Beirut in particular in four years. And he thought this was bad and that he needed to renew his contacts and get a sense of the smells and the feel of the ground. And, and uh, so he, on this trip, he, it was a, a whim. Um, he, he planned it a few weeks in advance. And initially, he was going to go to Tel Aviv first see his Mossad contacts, and then go to Beirut. He switched the plan at the last minute and, and instead went to Beirut first and was planning to go to Tel Aviv later. He arrived on a Sunday, had a lovely dinner hosted by the CIA station chief and all the other CIA officers uh, in the station, and um, the next day walked into the embassy, and a few hours later, the truck bomb rolled in, and, and he and all the people at that dinner were killed that that afternoon. It was really bad luck, and a, and a true tragedy for us too, because uh, even you know, it it really shook Ronald Reagan, and. George Shultz, the Secretary of State. You can see this in Reagan's own diary. Uh, the next day, he noted in the diary, we lost a very good man in, in Beirut today. That was the only American that Reagan had actually met and known. Um, and Shultz was devastated. He had put a lot of faith in Ames's judgment. And uh, after the embassy bombing, and then particularly six months later, you know, things began to just go downhill. Six months later, with the Marine barracks bombing, that was it. The Reagan people just, they walked away. They withdrew, they not only withdrew the Marines, but the Reagan administration lost any interest in pursuing the Reagan peace plan. Um, they stopped their public diplomacy, their private diplomacy, with both sides, with the Arabs and with the Israelis. So I argue that this, the one result of the bombings was that, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the uh, agreements that had been reached at Camp David by Jimmy Carter in, uh, in 1979, which, you know, formed a real framework for a long-term peace, were never carried out. Instead, things were allowed to just Fester. And the Israelis, the right wing, Likud political parties came, you know, pushed for more and more settlements. And that, you know, has created the impediments that we now have to even the possibility of a two state solution. So even that is sort of beginning to slip away. And poor John Kerry has just spent months and months with these trips back and forth. And he has just disastrously failed again. And we're stuck. And I would argue, you know, historically, it, it, the great slide downwards started in 1983 with this embassy bombing. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, the books are for sale behind the counter. Um, Kai will sign them for you right here. If you're watching online, give us a call. We'll get a book signed for you and ship it to you. Again, thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening here with us.
Thank you.